Hello, uh, my name is Adam, and I'm going to do a presentation on spiritual signs of the times, uh, whether prophecies have been fulfilled or not. I'm going to share this with people because I've shared this a lot with people in person and handed out my presentation before. And I think a lot more people might be interested in some of this, so uh, this will be an easy way for me to share it. Uh, my name is Adam, and um, I just want to give thanks and appreciation to many people who've helped me to be awake to some of the signs of the times. Um, I have read some books from various people, such as Jody Stoddart. Well, Jody Stoddart was videos, as well as a book by Michael Rush called A Remnant Shall Return. I highly recommend his books. He's written four, and I've, I've read each of those. Um, and there's a couple other books that I recommend that I will probably go into later, but um, I try to seek for truth from kind of three main areas that I talk about. One is, of course, the scriptures. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but these views and opinions are my own, um, so take them for what you will. So first is the scriptures, second the prophets living and past as well as listening to the spirit. And so I encourage you, whoever is watching this, the reader, the watcher, the viewer, to do the same thing. You know, pray to Heavenly Father, study the scriptures, um, listen to the spirit, what it's telling you. And also I encourage you to do what our prophet, President Nelson has said, which is focus on the temple and go to the house of the Lord often. Some of these inspirations and guidance I have received throughout the years and throughout my life, uh, the temple, is a very good place to find those. Um, anyway, so there's a little introduction about myself. Um, this one is presentation number two, entitled Spiritual Thought. Has the prophecies been fulfilled? Signs of the times, are we missing them? So far I have about four presentations and I will plan on doing more. Um, so this is going to be presentation number two. We need to be watching and listening. Um, DNC 45 verse 2 says, Hearken unto my voice, lest death shall overtake you. In an hour when you seek not, the summer shall be past, and the harvest ended, and your souls not saved. There will be signs in heaven and earth. Verse 38 and 40 and 45, Even so it shall be in that day, when they shall see all these things, then shall they know that the hour is nigh. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And then they shall look for me, and behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels, and he that watches not for me shall be cut off. Hence, we are actually commanded to watch for the signs. So a little bit about this. I grew up as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints all my life. I consider myself a strong and faithful member. And I hope to be able to endure to the end during these coming trials that I believe are coming soon. And I always knew a few highlight, a few outline bullet points, you might say, of things that are going to happen between now and the second coming of the Lord. And there's always the scripture quoted often in the church of no man knows the day nor the hour of his coming. And that's Jesus in the New Testament. So we always hear that. But I think it's also important to know what we don't know and what the scripture does not say. And I believe it was Jody Stoddart who helped me see this. She says, it says we don't know the day or the hour. But it doesn't say we don't know the year, or even the season, or the month, or even the week. And so if you think about it that way, wow, uh, yeah, we might even be able to know a year or a time frame. In fact, there is a scripture where it says, the children of darkness will not know the season, but ye are children of light, therefore you, sh you will know the season. So if you think about the season, that's even within a three month window, not just a year. And so as I thought about that, I thought, wow, uh, there might be more to know than I realized. And um, I think she said something like, well, if you look at the parable in that context that was given, 
Jesus says that it's in the context of the bridegroom coming um, in an hour that you know not, and it's at midnight. And so she says, well, if it's, let's just say 11.59 on a Friday, the hour is the 11th hour on a Friday. If the bridegroom comes at 12.01 a.m., it is the hour is 12 on a Saturday. Hence, you don't know the day or the hour, but we can know within a really short time frame. Now, there are scriptures, things like, the earth is like a woman in travail, about to give birth to a new baby. Well, the earth is going through these great tribulations because it's about to give birth to a new world. We are going to go from telestial to terrestrial. And the Doctrine and Covenant says at the end, it will go from terrestrial to celestial. This earth and its glorified and sanctified state will become like a celestial kingdom. Um, I will probably do further um, presentations on some of these sources. You can look them up, but um, I just want to give you a little background about why I think we should be looking for the signs. So if you think about it that when, when Jesus says the meek shall inherit the earth, he's saying the meek shall inherit the celestial kingdom because this earth will become a celestial kingdom. Right now we are in time. You know, we have from now until whenever the second coming is, and then we have a thousand years after that. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says at the end of the millennium, there will be a battle, and then God will declare that time shall be no more. So right now we are in time, but in eternity, uh, it will be the end of the millennium is when eternity begins and there won't be any time. But right now we are set in times and seasons, and we are actually commanded to watch for them. So then I started thinking, oh, well, maybe there's more to know than I realized. So there's a few key points that I've always heard most of my life growing up, such as, the gospel will be preached in all nations, and that's sort of the idea that you have to, um, God will be righteous and just and allow everyone an opportunity to hear the gospel before he judges them. And that is true. I think a lot of that will happen in, for, the, for many people in the spirit world because there's been so many people who haven't had the chance in life. But then the other signs are things like Article of Faith 10. You know, we believe New Jerusalem will be established upon this, the American continent. And as I quote scriptures, I'm doing them from memory, so they may not be precise word for word, but you can look them up to get the exact one. But um, Article of Faith 10, we believe New Jerusalem will be built on this, the American continent, so we know that's a sign. We also know that uh, Jerusalem and the Jews in Israel will build another temple. And um, at the last days, Jesus will come um, at the end when Jerusalem is about to be destroyed and save them. And then they will acknowledge him as their savior. And so there's various timelines and, and durations and events that are given. But there aren't, I thought there weren't a whole lot much else. Well, then when I started looking in the scriptures, I realized, wow, there are actually quite a lot of things out there. So a lot of the Old Testament prophets foresaw our day, such as Jeremiah, Daniel, Isaiah, um, Ezekiel, Joel, and even Jesus in Matthew 24 quotes Daniel the prophet when he's asked about the signs of the second coming. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, look out, it's coming, I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus himself is telling us to go read Daniel if we want to know the signs. And then there's the Nephites in the Book of Mormon. There are scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants. And there's so many scriptures out there that talk about things that are going to happen before the second coming. And so as I started studying and reading these, I realized, wow, there's a lot out there. And I can't remember when I first came across this idea of Joel chapter 1 possibly being fulfilled. But we'll get to that in a moment. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, so... In 2017, in, in August 21st, there was a solar eclipse that passed across this path of totality in the bottom left that you see here um, of the United States. My family and I were living in Kansas City, Missouri at the time. We lived very close to the Kansas City, Missouri temple. We could see it out of our back window. And we had been prompted by the Lord to, to move there for our family, and we did, and we were there during the eclipse. And I thought, oh, this will be nice to see an eclipse. You know, I, ha I don't remember a total eclipse for 
a long time and being in the path of totality. In the early 70s, when I was a young, a young boy, I remember seeing an eclipse and going out on the playground and seeing it, and our teachers giving us special ways to look at the eclipse, and I thought, well, this will be kind of fun. So we did. We went out and we saw the eclipse, and something really miraculous occurred during that time in Kansas City. And you can see the path of totality passed right, right over it. And what was really miraculous was they said all these people along the path throughout the United States were looking for it. They're like, I want to travel there and go see it. This is going to be fun. And we happened to be living there, so we didn't have to go anywhere. And I thought, well, I'm going to make sure I take the time and see it. And um, the clouds, people were saying, well, look, you, there may be an eclipse. You may be in the path of totality. But if the clouds come, you won't see it. So if it's cloudy weather, it doesn't matter. The, the clouds are going to obscure the sun and you won't see the eclipse. And I thought, okay, well, that'll be the same anywhere in the world. I'll just take my chances. I stay here. And right before the eclipse, I don't remember the exact time, but it was in the afternoon, one o'clock or so, two o'clock, I don't know. Um, it was cloudy and rainy that day in the morning. And about an hour before the eclipse, the clouds parted and the sun started to shine and we could see it really, really well. We saw the eclipse and it was miraculous and it was fun to watch. We saw the birds come out and sing and even the insects started to chirp. The street lights went out or went on as a result of the darkness. And you could actually feel the air get cold within a few minutes of the sun being blocked by the moon. And I had never experienced anything like that that I can recall, I mean, once when I was young, but I, I was too young to hardly remember much of it, the experience. And then, you know, the eclipse passed. And within about an hour or so after the eclipse, the clouds came back in and covered the sun and it began raining. Like we say, cats and dogs, it was raining profusely. And I have a video of this that I will probably share. Um, but anyway, I thought, well, that's pretty miraculous. And the thought I had, the impression I had was, you have just witnessed a miracle in the heaven. That is really neat. So fast forward to 2020 or so, I thought, well, that was nice. I didn't really think it meant much. It was just nice to see an eclipse. Um, later um, in 2021 or 2022, I started looking back for the signs through COVID and everything that happened. And then I did a Google search um, in 2022 and I said, you know, I wonder what happened. Was there any, anything significant in 2017? And I just Googled world history 2017 and I found some events and there was some in Jerusalem. But what I was surprised to find was in the United States that we had the largest natural disaster in US history when measured by economic damage, tying only with Hurricane Katrina. And what I was even surprised, if, and that was two days later on August 23rd, 2017, after the eclipse, it hit land. But what I was even more surprised to find later as I dug into this was that the hurricane that was to become Hurricane Harvey formed on the day of the actual eclipse on August 21st, 2017. And within two days, it made landfall and became this big natural disaster. So 2 Nephi 23, the destruction of Babylon is a type of a destruction at the second coming. So here we've got, that's in the synopsis of 2 Nephi 23. Here we've got the synopsis giving us an indication of what this is telling us. Now the chapter synopsises in the Book of Mormon and in scripture, I take them as sort of scripture as well. I don't know exactly who wrote them. We're not told specifically. I've heard that it was, it was people like Bruce R. McConkie who were apostles, possibly in connection with other people and review and so on. But I take them as um, really close to scripture, if not scripture as well. Some of the chapter headings, like in the Book of Mormon, the title page was actually written by them, not by Joseph Smith or anybody in Modern Prophets. It was part of the actual sacred text. But um, some of these chapter synopsises I, I also take for scripture. Um, sometimes I read the synopsis and I go, I don't get that. And sometimes I do. But I think I, I tend to follow that and, and lend more uh, credence to what the synopsis says. So in verse 9 and 10, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, 
and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So it occurred to me that during a solar eclipse, neither the sun nor the moon shines. The sun is blocked, the moon is, sh is not shining because it's reflective of the sun and the sun's behind it. So I thought, oh, maybe that's you know part of that fulfillment. Um, so then I started listening to other people and getting their, you know, advice and listening to things that were going to happen in the future. And in April 8th, 2024, which as of this day, uh, we are in end of March 2023, that that's in the future. So April 8th, 2024, the, the, the path of the total solar eclipse will be as shown here on the bottom right. And it's going to pass the path of totality will pass over Buffalo, New York and the Sacred Grove in Palmyra, New York. As you can see, it's going to make an arch over the eastern half. And some people have noted if you put the two together and you overlay them, it forms an X somewhere in Missouri. And they say that's significant. Um, don't know, but that's just something to consider. Um, so if the past is indication of the future, then I expect that within two to seven days after April 8th, 2024, we'll see, we will see another U.S. natural disaster equal to or greater than the 2017 Hurricane Harvey disaster. Um, and then four years and three days prior to that, April 5th, 2020, was a worldwide fast and a solemn assembly called in general conference. And just before that, in March 26th, all temples worldwide shut down. So those are almost seven years apart. I think that might be significant. And some of these other signs I'm going to get into, I think, uh, lead me to believe that that there could be there, these events could be significant. So um, DNC 45, I thought, is this COVID or is it a foreshadowing of COVID? Are these some of the signs of the times? Are we missing them? And I think a lot of scriptures might have dual fulfillment. So for example, the destruction of Babylon is the type of the destruction at the second coming. The destruction of, well, the captivity of Jew, Jews, as we know, is the Babylonian captivity. And the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem or of the Jews has multiple fulfillments. So it happened in 586 BC when Babylon took Jerusalem captive. And then when Jesus was alive, he predicted, prophesied to them that because you have rejected me, your city and your temple will be destroyed. There will not be one stone left upon another. And that was fulfilled a second time in uh, AD 70 when the Romans took over. And I understand it was Caligula that, that came in, destroyed the temple and offered sacrifice on those holy altars. And there will be a third time that I believe Jerusalem will be destroyed. And you can read about that in Revelation. And it's interesting because from what I understand in Revelation, it says Jerusalem will be under siege for 42 months, which is three and a half years. And I think it was also under siege for three and a half years in 70 AD and maybe maybe in Babylon as well. I'm not sure on that, but these these things seem to have a pattern and a repetition. And the Lord likes to use these patterns to show us that he knows what's coming and he knows he's going to do it precisely. So I thought, well, this might be COVID in DNC 45, but it could happen again a second or a third time. I don't know. But in verse 16 of 45, he says, I will show you plainly. He's like, okay, I'm about to talk to you plainly. Now, DNC is interesting in that we have revelation given in modern English, where a lot of these other scriptures were given in other languages. So I think we need to really pay attention to some of the modern scripture, particularly. In verse 19, it says the desolation shall come upon this generation. So if you think about this in context of could this be COVID, here's what I see. COVID was a sickness that devastated lives and economy. It was a desolation. Wars and rumors of wars and the whole earth shall be in commotion in verse 26. In verse 27, it talks about how iniquity will abound. I think we're there. March 18th, 2020, it says in verse 33, earthquakes in diverse places. Now the Salt Lake Valley had an earthquake of a magnitude 5.7 on that date, March 18th. And in April 2016, the prophet, I think he was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, Russell M. Nelson, said, perhaps one of those diverse places will be in our own homes where emotional, financial, or spiritual earthquakes may occur. 
So those earthquakes could be, you know, symbolic, but I also think we should not discount the possibility that they are also literal, which I think they will be, in my opinion. Uh, then within four days of that earthquake, March 22nd, it, okay, it says in verse 31, an overflowing scourge for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. So March 22nd, was it, COVID was a sickness that destroyed the lives and the economy, but on March 22nd was the first time that the COVID death, a COVID death had been reported in Utah. And these are the links um, that, that have the source where, where you can read about these. You can Google search them, but these are the sources. And then within three days after that, on March 25th, the First Presidency announces the shutdown of all temples worldwide to be effective the following day, the 26th of March, 2020. Verse 20, it says the temple shall be thrown down. Um, see also Joel 1. In Joel 1, this was repeated. Verse 9, 13, and 16, three times. And it says that the meat offering and the drink offering of the Lord's house will be taken away. Uh, or something like the daily sacrifice of the Lord's house will be taken away. Now keep in mind that Joel, their modern day practice did not include proxy ordinances. They were offering sacrifice of meat and burnt offerings and so forth. But he was seeing a vision of our day in the future. So that's not what he saw, I don't believe. He saw like our day being, our temples being shut down. And then in Daniel 8, 11 and Daniel 12, 11, it also mentions the daily sacrifice being taken away from the house of the Lord or the drink offering and the meat offering. Some people say that's referring to the sacrament. You have a drink offering of the water and the meat offering of the bread. But I think because it says the Lord's house, yeah, that might be the meeting house, but... Um, I'll jump ahead of myself a little bit, but yeah, verse 32, I'll come to that in a minute. But I think it was referring to our temples because a lot of these signs are signs about the Lord's house, like the new Jerusalem being built, like the, the temple in Jerusalem being built. Signs of temples are, I believe, signs, and especially worldwide signs that happen worldwide are also signs. So in verse 32, it says, My disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. Well, where was our holy place during COVID? The temples were shut down. That's not the holy place. The meeting houses were shut down. That's not the holy place. Our homes were the last place. And be not moved? We could not be moved from our homes due to quarantines. In Salt Lake County, they had a quarantine for two weeks, and only essential, quote-unquote, workers could leave or people could leave to get food or go to work and that was about it and even going to work you know so it was more severe or less severe in other parts of the world but in in utah county salt lake county i mean uh we had quarantine for about two weeks verse 33 yet men will harden their hearts against me and they will take up the sword one against another and they will kill one another so by may 26 2020 we had these pro protests beginning from the george floyd death which many of you recall and by June, there was over 200 U.S. cities had imposed curfews. 30 states in Washington, D.C. activated 96,000 national and state guards. And if you look at the Wikipedia article on this, it says the deployment, when combined with pre-existing deployments related to COVID-19 pandemic and other natural disasters, constituted the largest military operation other than war in U.S. history. So... That, I think, might be significant when you take uh, in verse 33 in context. Verse 63, you hear of wars in foreign lands, but behold, I say unto you, they are nigh even at your doors. Not many years hence, you shall hear of wars in your own lands. So I think this is foreshadowing that we will likely have wars and civil unrest in the U.S. not many years hence. And then verse 66 talks about the building of Jerusalem. You must flee to Zion for safety in verse 68. So there's a couple of these things that, you know, could be referring to the, our time in COVID. So somehow, and I can't remember how, I wish I had written it down, but somehow by around this time, I started thinking, well, let's look at Joel. And I felt like Joel 1 and 2 was fulfilled and might be fulfilled again, but I think it was fulfilled in March, April 2020 up and through 2022. So let's take a look at chap Joel chapter 1, verse 2. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the spiritual or secular reference from current news articles and scripture. On the left, you have the event that I'm kind of summarizing what the verse says. 
And then we have the date of the event in the middle. So the first thing he says is like, this hasn't happened in your days or your father's days. So two generations, you might say, COVID pandemic hasn't happened. Um, a worldwide pandemic hadn't happened in at least two generations. Some say, well, there's the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Yeah, but that was over 100 years ago. So I say, you know, this could be one of those things. So in verse four, he talks about conquering armies, having eaten your food. He compares it to locusts in four stages of growth. So if you look at Joel 1, 4, and you look at the footnote, um, footnote 4a says these are re representing invading armies in various stages of development. The palmer worm, the locust worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. So he's using the word locusts have devoured your, your food, but it's symbolic of armies devouring your food. Well, this, this part here didn't happen until February 2022 and beyond. Russia and Iran invade Ukraine and steals 30% of the world's grain. Uh, fertilizer limits worldwide. Russia produces a lot of fertilizer. They actually steal their food and take it off as they're conquering Ukraine, attempting to. So I believe that when it says media and Persia in the scripture, it's referring to Russia and Iran, and that will be a different presentation. But I'll give you a couple of hints. There's a couple of links here on the right where I kind of learned a little bit about that. That has to do with the Medes. Uh, and many people do not know or realize that, that the Russian alphabet is based on the Greek alphabet. So the other part is King of Grecia, representing the East. That is the Eastern half of the world, not necessarily Greece itself. But Russia, I believe, was not a written language for many years. And they had the Medes or the Russians, modern day Russians, had had connections and trade with Greece for a long time. And so there are these two brothers, um, I wish I could remember his name, Cyril, I think, and another brother. And they went to Greece and they said, we don't have a written language. Can we borrow your, your alphabet? And they're like, sure. So they borrowed their alphabet and they created what's called the Cyrillic alphabet after the brother Cyril. And it's based on the Greek alphabet. And that Cyrillic alphabet is used by other languages other than Russian, uh, Ukrainian, which is closely related, Bulgarian, uh, I think even Czech and some others, or not Czech, but anyway, some of these other languages around the Baltic area, around the Black Sea, are based on the Greek alphabet because they've had trade with Greece for a long time. And there's some links there. Verse 5, it says, the new wine is cut off. Now, you can look at this as uh, maybe there was wine offering they did in the temple, and so that was cut off, but we actually halted alcohol production in certain areas of the country, the U.S., because they were looking for rubbing alcohol, for hand sanitizer for COVID. And they didn't have enough. And the breweries, the mi breweries and microbreweries had shut down because of travel restrictions and the travel industry had collapsed. And restaurant industries weren't um, seeing people go out and eat. And so they started halting alcohol production. And then what did they do? They produced hand sanitizer. <laughs> and so there's some articles there you can read about that. So that's one way to look at the new wine being cut off. Verse 10 and 12, your field of your corn is wasted, your harvest is perished, your trees are withered. And that happened during COVID. Here's an April 9th article from The Guardian uh, in the UK where it talks about the food supply waste that happened because nobody could buy the food. They were all stuck home or quarantined and not spending money and traveling. And so a lot of these fields got plowed under. There was harvests that were just literally being plowed under and dumped and milk was being dumped and you know, so we, we saw a lot of harvest being wasted. And in verse 10, it says, the oil languisheth. Now, you can take this as a spiritual oil that they use to anoint in temples, or you could take this as lamp oil. But if you look in our day, I think oil is pri primarily, when you hear oil, big oil, you think of petroleum and gasoline. And our strategic oil reserves in the U.S. had reached maximum capacity. We had nowhere to sell the oil and the gasoline and the diesel fuel. The oil prices dropped worldwide, it was overflowing, so our oil was languishing, sitting. And there was a big glut in oil. Um, locusts, if you want to look at it symbolically as invading armies, that happened, but there was actually literally locusts. There's some articles in NPR and BBC and so on that in Wikipedia that talk about a global locust plague of biblical scope, and that's what they actually said in NPR. 
And there was billions of these locusts in the, in, in the Middle East area and Africa and some other places. We even had what was what is termed the Mormon cricket. We had infestations of, of biblical proportions, they called it in the Salt Lake Tribune, that actually infested parts of Utah and Idaho and other places, and I think even Washington or Oregon. And that was in 2022, and so we had some of that actually going on. Now, Joel, verse one, Joel 1, verse 6, he says, A nation without number has done it. Joel 8, 11 through 12 says, A host was given him by reason of transgression to take away the daily sacrifice of the sanctuary. So if you think about where the news reports were that COVID originated, whatever you think of this source or origination of COVID-19, it was reported it started in the Wuhan, China market. So it started in a nation which was one of the most populous nations, which is China. And it was through that nation that the daily sacrifice of the Lord's house was taken away because it started in China and, China, and the COVID virus is what caused the shutdown of the temples. And so that's one way to look at it. Um, and I believe in Daniel 8, 21, the king of Greece, it represents China. So China has a role to play in the cleansing of Babylon and the destruction of Babylon, as well as Russia and, and, and Iran, Media and Persia. So uh, verse 18 of Joel 1, the beasts and the cattle grown, the sheep and the flocks were made desolate. Well, the sheep industry actually collapsed worldwide. In New Zealand, there's only one country in the nation of the world that grades the wool. They can produce it anywhere they want, but if they want to sell it, it has to be graded and it has to go to New Zealand. Well, New Zealand had, had shut down their country. And because of that, because they took strict quarantine measures, New Zealand for several years had zero COVID deaths, which was kind of an anomaly in a lot of parts of the world because it even reached parts of Antarctica and really extreme parts of the world. But New Zealand was free of it because they had shut down their sheep industry. So even the sheeps of the flocks were made desolate. And there were literally sheep that, you know, they had nowhere to sell the lamb and the beef and that's, they slaughtered sheep. Uh, you can look um, in some news articles in Utah, for example, there was a lot of sheep herders and they, they killed their sheep, made or gave them to some of the Navajo nations for wool, for food and so on. So they actually did that in the U.S. as well. So there were some things that actually happened with the flocks. Uh, Joel 1, 9, 13 and 16. Again, it was repeated three times. The offering is cut off from the house of the Lord, which I believe was the temples being shut down. And it talks about a daily sacrifice. So if you think about a daily sacrifice of the Lord's house, that's why I don't think it's our chapels, because those are only offered weekly. And I think that's why it represents um, the temples and not our um, meeting houses. Because if it was the sacrament, it would be a weekly sacrifice. The closest thing we have to a daily sacrifice is the temples being open. Most temples are open Tuesday through Saturday. There is one temple that I know of in the world. There might be more, but there's one that's open on Monday, half a day, which is Provo, Utah. So in Provo, it's open Monday through Saturday and closed on Sunday. So basically, you have the daily sacrifice Monday through Saturday being offered in Provo. And then on Sunday, you have a sacrifice of the sacrament meeting. So you have sort of a daily sacrifice if you look at it that way. And both of those were shut down, the Provo Temple as well as all meeting houses. Now that's worldwide as well. All temples were shut down worldwide. But so I think it has to do with temples. That's my interpretation of it. Now, a lot of times in scriptures, when things are repeated three times, it can be a sign from the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. And it was repeated three times in Joel 1. And it was also mentioned in Daniel 8, 11 and Daniel 12, 11. And then there's a, uh, see, I have a note of DNC 4520. Um, so, which indicates the temples being overthrown or something. Um, so we also have in Joel 1, 9 through, 19 through 20, it talks about the rivers of water are dried up. Your fowers, fire has devoured wilderness and burned trees of the field. We had wildfires and drought in 2020. We had over 1,547 Utah wildfires. Uh, we had the ongoing worst drought in 1,200 years um, in 2020, and it impacted the area of Utah. And I will tell you why I think Utah is significant in a, in a moment. 
But um, we have the most important things, I think, that lead me to believe that Joel 1 and 2 were fulfilled was there was three things that the prophet did, and it was called by the prophet. And the first one I've talked about, which is the shutdown of temples. The second one here on the left is the worldwide fast. And it was called twice by the prophet for COVID-19 relief and miracles. And that was not just our faith, but other faiths joined us in that fast. And it was during Good Friday. So that's the second thing. We have the shutdown of temples. We have a worldwide fast called twice. And the third thing is the Hosanna shout and the worldwide solemn assembly that we had um, on April 6, 2020. So I think when you take those three things and you say, when has there been a Hosanna shout with babes that suck the breast, which are babies who are not weaned? When have you had a worldwide one? When have you had a worldwide fast? And when have you had the temple shut down all at once, all called by the prophet within about two or three weeks of each other? And it was in 2020. It was in March and April. So again, here, Joel 1, 14, 2, and 12. It's mentioned twice to call a fast of the inhabitants of the whole land, which I think is the earth. And that happened twice, and it's mentioned twice. And then um, Joel 14, 1, 14, and Joel 2, 15. We had a worldwide solemn assembly. Actually, this this is kind of funny because when I wrote this, I, I since refined it and I realized um, there's more to it than what I wrote and it was a little bit incorrect. <laughs> so I thought we had a first worldwide Hosanna shout of the temple dedication in Palmyra, New York in April 6, 2000. What I learned was it wasn't a worldwide shout. It was a, shout, uh, a broadcast for North and South America. So it was a, a North and South America broadcast, but it wasn't until April 5th, 2020 that I know of where we had a, an official worldwide shout. So it was actually the first worldwide Hosanna shout. Um, so the distance between those two is about 20 years. Now that may be significant. That may be what is mentioned in Revelations 8.1. It says there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Second Peter 3.8 says one day with God is a thousand years with man. So if you take 30 minutes, then that's about 20.83 years, which is about half an hour. And there's about a half an hour between those two shouts. Now they're not two worldwide shouts like I have on this presentation, but they're very close. Um, so that could be significant. Um, and it says call all the people, okay? So um, my question is this half an hour of silence that's mentioned in Revelations, is when the seventh seal opens. Now there's different seals. And so if it really opened, say 2000, or if it opened in 2020, I think it opened in 2000, that's my personal opinion, then we've seen something significant around 9-11, uh, 2000. We had April 6, 2000, the seal opening. And then we have September 11, 2000, when the 9-11 attack occurred on New York. And so that was significant, I believe. Um, so you have these events. Now, I think what this signals to us is that Babylon is falling. And so what we're seeing is some of these scriptures here mentioned in their Nephi, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, um, started to be fulfilled beginning with the COVID pandemic. So on the left, we have this event of Babylon being cleansed. I'm going to destroy your, char your chariots. 3 Nephi 21, 14. Well, what is our chariots today? Our chariots are cars and that's our airplanes. Well, in the spring of 2020, the auto industry declined by over 15%. The airline industry collapsed. They had $35 billion in loss in the USA alone. In May of 2020, the Hertz rent a car that had been in business for over 100 years filed for bankruptcy. That never happened. And so that was significant. This chariot started being destroyed. In fact, I've heard it said by people that the airline industry had more pilots than passengers. <laughs> so they had to shut down, which they did. And now that it's sort of quote unquote rebounding, they're having a hard time hiring pilots back and training them. And we're starting to see airline safety uh, being impacted. 
Um, so the other thing it says about Babylon destruction is I will utterly destroy their idols and their graven images. Well, what is our idol? Well, we have a whole show. It's called American Idol. And so our, our idols are movies, our plays, our sports, our entertainment, our concerts. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are good in moderation. But a lot of those things have turned into promotion of Babylon and worldliness. And those things got shut down during COVID. And that's the reference for that's 3 Nephi 31, 17. Um, so um, the other thing it says is Babylon, uh, your highways are going to be broken up, laid waste and desolate. Well, during COVID, the highways were literally empty in a lot of places. And there's some references there, Isaiah 33, Judges 5, Helaman 14, and 3 Nephi 8 with those verses. Um, and then the Lord says, if the Gentiles don't repent, I will destroy their idols and I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver and gold. And they will not take no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. They will be of fierce countenance and they won't regard the old or the young. So it wasn't until I saw Russia attack Ukraine and I started reading news reports of Russia bombing maternity wards while women are in labor and putting at threat of death innocent men, women, and children, that I started to say, wait a minute, this scripture came to my mind in 2 Nephi 23, 17 and 18, where it says this. And I thought to myself, well, that's the behavior of the Medes. I wonder if the Medes are the Russians. And I it was like shocked when this came to me. This was just sort of an inspiration or an idea that came. And I thought to myself, wow, this might be the Medes. And I started studying it and I read the history of media. Media was Iran and they, the people of media uh, immigrated over many years up into Russia and they are the Russians. So when he says, I'm gonna stir up the Medes against you, he's gonna stir up the Russians. And this is the same pattern that the Lord did with Babylon. If you read about the story of the writing on the wall where Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall for the king, the writing actually said something like tekel tekel upsharam, which means you have been judged and found wanting. Your kingdom is now divided between the Medes and the Persians. And Babylon was overthrown and given to the Medes and the Persians. So we're seeing media and Persia. There are scriptures that even says the Lord raised up the king of media and Persia to cleanse Babylon and destroy Babylon. It was Darius the Mede that destroyed Babylon. Um, so the Lord has allowed these nations of Russia, China, Iran, and others to be raised up to cleanse Babylon. So here's the one that really got me. It was in Deuteronomy 28, 33, 38, and 39. It says a foreign invading army will eat your food. And that happened in February 2020. The Russians were coming in, attacking Ukraine. And while they're killing them, begging for food because they ran out of fuel for their tanks. In fact, my understanding was Putin said, oh, don't bring your winter coats. Just bring your military stuff. You're going to be marching in and out of Kiev in two weeks and taking over. And you won't even need your winter coats. And they ran out of gas before they even got there, many of their tanks. And they ran out of food. And there's a little story about how the Russian armies were not only begging for food, but they started eating dogs because they had no food. <laughs> So in Deuteronomy 28, 48, it says that. It says your foreign invading army comes in hunger to attack you. And so that actually happened in Deuteronomy 28, 48, and it happened in February 22, Russia and armies beg for food. So that happened. So I'm like, wow, this is part of that cleansing of Babylon. And if you think about Daniel again, Daniel 6, 8, verse 8, 12, and 15, the Medes and the Persians passed a law against Daniel that they should only pray to or worship the king. And anybody who didn't would be thrown in the lion's den. So the Medes and the Persians were the ones who threw Daniel in the lion's den in the first place. So they have been, you know, part of the thorn in the side of the Jews for a while here. And the president of Ukraine is Jewish as well, which is interesting. Um, so they attacked and they came in in February 2020 with help from Iran. Iran sent drones to Russia to help. Okay, uh, Daniel um, mentions this. 
that it was going to be the Medes and the Persians. And Daniel 8 has a little bit more about that. Um, and here we are in Jeremiah 51, 11, 28 and 29. It says, the Lord raises the kings of the Medes, the Eastern world, against Babylon. So he's done this to cleanse Babylon. And then, as I mentioned before, here's the scripture reference of the, the story of the writing on the wall where it was divided between the Medes and the Persians. It's Daniel 5, 28, I believe, uh, 11, 1 and 2 mention them, and then there's Jeremiah. So I think we're starting to see that. Now, what are some past temple signs we've seen? Um, I'm going to mention some things here that have been published. January 1st, 2019, we had in changes in the endowment. And there's some references there in the church news article. Um, and by the end of 2019, we had COVID-19. So I believe whenever there's spiritual changes in the world, we're going to see corresponding temporal changes within a short period of time. And March 15th, 2019, the prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, went to the Rome temple. And he said he felt, he said he didn't feel, he said he was directed by the Lord to not only dedicate the temple, and that it was going to be a hinge point in church history and world history. But he says he was directed by the Lord to call all the First Presidency and all members of the Quorum of the Twelve. So you have 15 people going to the Rome Temple. And he said that was a hinge point. So that hadn't happened in over 100 years where all of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency had left the boundaries of the U.S. and went to another country. And he said this was, this was significant. And they announced changes to ceremonial clothing. Um, they shut down the temples by March of 2020. So a little over a year after those temple changes, we had in January 2019, we had March 25th, 2020, all temples shutting down. And they announced some more changes. Okay, so he said on the left here, bottom left, things are going to move forward at an accelerated pace, said President Nelson. The church is going to have an unprecedented future, unparalleled. We're just building up to what's ahead now. So we're seeing these changes happen. And um, so I think that is significant. So what is the future? Well, this is where I'm going to go into a little bit more later. But um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 he sees the shutdown of the Lord's house, the sacrifice of the Lord's house being taken away, as I've mentioned. And then he sees the abomination of desolation come. And he's given a time. How long is it between the temple shutting down and the abomination of desolation coming? And the angel gives him a specific number of days, 1290 days, three and a half years. So my date here is wrong. It's not October 6th. It's October 7th because I didn't count March 26th instead of March 25th of when it shut down. I believe that's right. Double check if you have questions. But I believe this is pointing us to October 7th of 2023, which is this year. And then Daniel 12:12, 12, 12, he said, blessed is though he who waiteth. It actually isn't 2300 days or 6.3 years. There's another scripture that references that, but it's in, um, it says, blessed is he who waits 1335 days, which I think is 45 days after the 1290. So there seems to be a, a cleansing of 45 days between the start of the abomination of desolation of 1290 and the 1335 days. So I think there's going to be some kind of cleansing. There is a note about 2300 days, which is 6.3 years, which that puts us in 2026. Um, I haven't done the math on the actual date, but here that's that's another topic. I'll have to go find that reference again. But um, so I started thinking about this. Now let me go back to I'll, I'll finish this and then I'll go back to what I think it means. So um, great blessings await. So I don't want to leave you with all doom and gloom. There's some great things in Joel 2:11. The Lord's people, His army, will be great. The earth will quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. He is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? So we have a great and terrible day of the Lord coming. It's going to be great for those who are prepared and terrible for those who aren't. And so there's great blessings coming, but it doesn't with you don't receive the blessings until after the trial of your faith. So I think we're going to see lots of trials coming up before these blessings. And President Nelson has said things like, between now and the second coming, we will see some, some of the most miraculous works the Lord has ever done. 
And there's even a scripture that talks about how that those miracles will be greater, the miracles of the restoration of the lost 10 tribes in specific, will be greater than the parting of the Red Sea from the children of Israel. So, you know, that's just one of them that's going to be part of that restoration. The prophet has said, the church is not fully restored. And I think one of those things that will be restored is the lost 10 tribes. And that's from our article of faith, 10, I think, and some of the scriptures. But there's other things that are going to be restored, which is kind of another topic. But, you know, he says, um, you are God's mighty army, talking to the priesthood. You're to help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. This is our charge. And that was April 2018 conference. A fire, a fire devoureth before them. In front of the land is the Garden of Eden and behind is a desolate wilderness. I think this might be referring to um, whether it's the lost 10 tribes or some, some type of Lord's army that's going to destroy the wicked. I think it's um, Amos who says the ashes will be like the wicked will be like ashes under your feet. Um, so again, Joel 2.16, he says, call a solemn assembly and babes as well for the solemn assembly. Now, April 2020 that I know of was the first time where you have a solemn assembly where babies could be present. I think the other time I only, only, only other time I know is Kirtland, Ohio Temple, where they say babies were there and babies that couldn't talk raised up and said, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they waved their handkerchiefs. And that was like miraculous. It was a Pentecostal type of event. Some people saw angels on the roof and fire coming from at the Kirtland temple. And so we haven't had a Psalm assembly since that. A Hosanna shout is usually reserved for a temple dedication, which is usually 12 and up. So we've never had one where babies could be there. Now going back for a bit, to my disciples will stand in holy places and be not moved from DNC 45. Those holy places, I believe, were our temple. And I believe one of those purposes of the Hosanna shout and the solemn assembly was to dedicate our homes to be like a temple. And that was our holy place. And so I think that's why the babies were allowed to be there because it was a broadcast. It was anybody and everyone who would tune in. It wasn't just church members. It was anybody listening with eyes to hear and ears to see ears to see eyes to see and ears to hear <laughs> so um, and the Lord says you know I'm gonna restore your your grain and your fruit that you've lost after all these trials I will restore the years the locusts have eaten uh, this one I really like in verse 28 and 29 of Joel 2 great prophecies and dreams and an outpouring of the spirit await and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. So a lot of people think, well, you're trying to prophesy. Well, I'm not prophesying. I'm just trying to interpret what has been written in the scripture. Why is the Lord telling us? Why is he giving us durations of days and times and seasons? Why has he told us about the signs in heavens and earth? Because he wants us to understand them. He's telling us for a purpose and he wants us to know that he is in charge and that he knows what's going to happen. And so he's telling us he's going to allow us to have this spirit in a greater abundance than we've ever had. People are going to give prophecies and dreams and even young men will see visions. And so this is part of the prophecies of Joel. This is what's in scripture that's being told to us that we will have that. So I think we have great blessings. Now, what did President Nelson say in October 2020 to the women in the women's session? He said, prepare spiritually and temporally and never stop like Captain Rona. For decades, the Lord's prophets have urged us to store food, water, and financial reserves for a time of need. The current pandemic has reinforced the wisdom of that council. I urge you to take steps to be temporally prepared. We can learn a lot from Captain Moroni. As commander of the Nephite armies, he faced opposing forces that were stronger, greater in number, and meaner. So Moroni prepared his people in three essential ways, which were, he said, prepare places of security, which is our homes, number one. Number two, prepare to be faithful unto the Lord, which is the spiritual preparation. And three, never stop preparing. 
his people, physically or spiritually. And he said, because the adversary will never stop. So prepare temporally and spiritually and never stop. When he says never stop, I think he means never stop. We need to keep being on our guard. Now, I believe the time of the coming of Jesus is near. Sister Wendy Watson Nelson in the CES devotional of BY Hawaii, January 10th, 2016. And at this point, this is seven years ago, four or three, yeah, seven years ago, almost over seven years. My dear brothers and sisters whom I love, the reality is that someday you and I will each have an individual face-to-face -face interview with the Savior himself. When this eventually becomes real to us, we will be willing to do whatever it takes to be prepared. So now a question as I conclude, what if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth, that he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several marvelous large gatherings, gatherings about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing. If you found out the Savior was already on the earth, what would you desperately want to do today? And what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? So I'll just leave you with that question. If you knew the Savior was coming, what would you be willing to do? Get ready, it's coming. Now, I'm gonna share with you in the last five minutes, because I wanna keep this to one hour, what I believe this abomination of desolation is. And this has come through uh, pondering prayer and speaking with my wife, who also gave me some great keys to understanding this. Um, okay, Daniel 12, 11, abomination of desolation. I'll try to wrap it up. First, I was like, what does this mean? I looked in the Bible dictionary. It talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, the altars being desecrated, and Jerusalem being destroyed, cleansing of the holy people. Some, by some accounts, it's 90% of all the Jews died in Jerusalem in AD 70, and there was 10% left. I think Isaiah says, I will cleanse, it with, cleanse Jerusalem with the spirit of burning and fire, and only the righteous will be left afterwards. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, that's, okay, that's, I understand that. Well, I believe that Salt Lake City and Jerusalem have something in common. And the geography of the earth itself testifies of this. So if you think about the two largest landlocked bodies of salt in the world, landlocked, you've got the Dead Sea, which is the lowest elevation spot on the earth. Jesus descended below all things to rise above all. He was in that lowest spot on the earth elevation wise. He descended below everything. The other Dead Sea, is Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And then you have a fresh body of water, the Sea of Galilee. And in Utah, you have Utah Lake. And they're both connected by a river, oddly enough, both named the Jordan River. So the Jordan River, the pioneers named that river after the Jordan River of the Holy Land. And so those two rivers connect them from what I understand. I could be wrong, but I think they do. I live near it, I should know, but that's what I understand. So um, a spiritual capital city of the world. If you think about what is that spiritual capital city of the world? The scripture for that is in the last days, and it's talking about the millennium. I think it's Isaiah. I wish I could have the scripture here, but it says in that day, speaking of the millennium, the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Zion is interpreted as New Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord is Jerusalem, as in Israel. There's going to be two capital cities of the world in the millennium. One is New Jerusalem, and the other is Jerusalem. So taking that pattern, if there is a spiritual capital city of the world today, what would that be? So you look at the geography, and you're like, okay, well, the geography tells me it's Salt Lake City. And if you believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's restored church on the earth today, and not everybody believes that, I understand. But for those who do, this Salt Lake City is the headquarters city of the Lord's restored church. So therefore, what happens in Salt Lake City is a type and a symbol of what has and will happen in Jerusalem. And so if you take that, then what happens in Salt Lake City is a sign for the world, not just for them. And the pattern of that is, as I've mentioned, March 22nd, 2020, COVID death entered Utah, and that's why it was significant, because within three days, they announced the closing of the temple on the fourth day worldwide, all over the world. March 26, 2020, all temples shut down. So I think that what happens in Salt Lake City is like the spiritual capital. So we had sort of the abomination of desolation, where the spiritual activity of the world was shut down due to COVID. 
of the temples. The most highest work that we can do is in the temples. And in our own homes, of course. The, our own homes continued, but um, the temple work stopped. And so now I turn to the, the temporal capital city of the world. What would that be? So at first when I was pondering this, I thought, well, you know, we, we in the West say the United States is the leader of the free world, right? <laughs> and I thought Washington, D.C. And then I've been pondering about this idea of seven years of tribulation. There's three and a half years of light tribulation and three and a half years of heavy tribulation. And then it equals seven. Seven is a sign of perfection of the Lord. The seven days the Lord made the heaven and earth. And I've heard this idea, you know, 1290 days, as we read in Daniel 12, 11, that's three and a half years. Uh, in Revelation, it says Jerusalem will be under siege for 42 months. That's three and a half years. There's also this idea of a time, a times, and time and a half, which is a time is one, times is two. You add those together, that's three, and a half is three and a half. So there's some scriptures that indicate three and a half is significant. Uh, some have put them together, two three and a half year periods, and put it at seven. So as I was pondering this, my wife was like, ah, I got it. It's three and a half years of spiritual tribulation and three and a half years of temporal tribulation. And I thought, oh, okay, I think she's onto something. And then as I read DNC 84, I finally came across this. I was reading it for some other purpose and I found DNC 84, verse 114 and 115, I believe it is. It says, warn the city of New York and Boston and Albany that if they don't repent, and I'm not getting it quite word for word, but their house will be left utterly of the utter desolation and abomination that wait their houses. So he mentions the city of New York, Boston, and Albany. And it's in the context of like the 1830s and the missionary work that they're trying to do in the Northeast and they kind of rejected him. The first vision happened in the state of New York, in Palmyra, New York, and they were driven from New York to state to state till Utah, the early saints. So it's in the context of that, but it's also significant that 20, 200 years to the date from 1820 to 2020 was that these events happened. <laughs> and the prophet had declared in 2019 that next year will be like a year of a general conference, a bicentennial year that will be unlike any other. In 2019, in April, he said that. And then in 2020, he's like, well, I didn't really think it was gonna be quite like this. I think perhaps he was being modest I think he kind of knew something big was happening and he was only allowed to say so much. If he were to tell us too much, it would sort of take away the need for faith. And you have to see the signs with an eye of faith and with ears to hear and eyes to see. And so I believe that what will happen here is in October 7, 2023, or sometime shortly after that, maybe that starts some events that we're gonna have temporal tribulations. And then as I started po pondering upon this, I realized, Oh, we have a pattern for this. 9-11-2000, September 11, 2000, New York City was attacked and it produced a global recession and the worldwide economy was changed and our world was changed forever. We still, air travel still is much tighter security than it was before that. It changed some of our freedoms. It did a lot of things in 9-11 attacks. So if that passed as indication of the future, if New York City were to either be attacked through natural or man-made disasters, whether it's sickness, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a war or simple panic, like a bank panic or whatever it is, social unrest, that would produce a global, and I will use the word depression instead of recession. I think the media and a lot of people are trying to be modest in their estimates to not cause panic and say a, a de depression. They use the word recession many economists and world leaders believe that a recession is coming by the end of 2023. But I believe that's what's going to happen. Again, I could be wrong. It'd take it for what you will. But I think there's so many three significant things that happened in 2020, the shutdown of temples, the worldwide fast and the solemn assembly. And uh, combined with all those other things that happened in context that all happened around that time, that I think this is, this is right. Now, one other final thing I'll leave you with that someone graciously pointed out to me was, have you read the Old Testament study guide that the church put out? And I thought, no, I should. I should have probably read that for Joel 1. What does it say? And I read it and it says, Joel 1, the daily sacrifice and the meat offering and drink offering taken away is the loss of temple worship. So the church had published that in their student manual of the Old Testament for Joel 1 many years before this. 
So if you take the Old Testament student manual interpretation of it as a valid interpretation, it may or may not have been written by a prophet, that, that student manual, but uh, I believe it's a serious consideration. It gives it even that much more weight. So thank you for listening. Uh, I will be doing others and appreciate you taking the time. Please share this with others and see you later.